Um, well, welcome everyone. I think um, it's time that we we begin. Um, I would like to um, thank um, Ugo and James from the Restart Project very much for giving their time um, to us this evening to talk about repair data and some of the tools that we can use. Um, this is really an opportunity um, that we'd like to provide to you through um, the support of the Australian Repair Network that we um, value to show the value that you contribute to our econ repair economies. Sorry, that is my dog um, in Australia in terms of the repairing that you're doing. And we really um, want to thank all of the work that you do. And we thought that this um, workshop would provide an opportunity for you to just um, learn about some of the tools that some of the other repair cafes are using um, in other countries, but also here in Australia, um, to collect the information about all of the repairs that you're doing. And we know that some of you do a really great job and are using some of these tools already. Um, others of you may be um, considering um, collecting the data or using different methods. So this is really an opportunity for us um, to learn. And I'll hand over to um, James and Ugo from the Restart Project, who are going to lead um, this seminar tonight. But there'll be plenty of opportunities for um, discussion and contributions from you so that you can get the best value out of this. Um, this will be recorded as well and will be made available so that those of um, the repairers and repair conveners who weren't able to join us this evening um, will be able to access this in the future as well. So um, thank you once again for joining us and I'll hand over to James and Ugo um, from the Restart Project to um, talk to you about repair data. Thank you. Hi everybody. Thanks so much for that introduction, Leanne. Um, evening everybody. Uh, my name is James Pickstone. Uh, I work for the Restart Project, uh, along with Ugo, who's also with us this evening. He's waving in the top, I'm not sure if you can see that. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we're the Restart Project. We're a London-based uh, social enterprise and charity. Um, and we've been working for about 10 years in the space of community repair to run community repair events in London. Uh, and we currently run a network of around a dozen or so um, repair groups in the city. Um, and we also support repair groups around the world um, with running events and managing data and so on. And so that's one of the reasons we're here this evening. Um, so we're here to share our story, uh, kind of what we've been doing over the last 10 years, uh, some of the tools that we've built, some of the work that we've been doing with data specifically to offer some kind of inspiration uh, and share our experience and some ideas uh, with all of you this evening. Um, so we'll go through a little bit about our background, um, how we've got to where we are, what, what we do currently, um, sharing some of the tools that we've developed, plus other tools that exist uh, in the world of community repair that are useful for logging data, measuring impact, sharing data, and so on. Uh, we'll also briefly cover a little bit of the why repair data. Um, so kind of why it's actually useful for groups and useful for the wider repair movement more broadly. Um, and Leanne will touch on some of the Australian context for that as well. Um, uh, but there'll be plenty of opportunities for all of us just to have a bit of a chat about data, what we currently do, uh, what we'd like to do as repair groups uh, and, and ways of doing <laughs> what we'd like to do with the repair data. So how to record it, how to share it, how to measure impact, all of that kind of stuff. And so there'll be lots of opportunities just to have a discussion uh, between us. Given we're quite a big group tonight, We'll probably break out into a couple of rooms, different rooms for those discussions and then report back afterwards uh, just so that everyone gets more of an opportunity to speak uh, because 32 people is quite a few people so it might be a bit unmanageable all in the same space so we'll try and break out where we can. Um, I'm assuming at this point most people are fairly familiar with Zoom um, but just in case uh, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. So at the bottom of your screen uh, you should be able to see buttons to enable or disable your camera, enable or disable your microphone. Um, there's also a chat button, which you can click to bring up a text chat. Feel free to use the text chat at any point um, during this evening um, to say hello to people, to ask questions. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that chat and see if we can answer questions as they come up during the session. 
um, anything we can't answer kind of in, at the moment, we'll try and answer in the, in the chat afterwards. Um, those are the key things. If you're not currently speaking, do try to keep your microphone muted just to avoid any background noise, uh, dogs or kids or, you know, the usual. In my case, a, a very loud cat who is after her breakfast this morning. Um, but yeah, otherwise the usual kind of Zoom, Zoom stuff applies. If you've got any, any questions, just hit the chat at the bottom um, and I'll do my best to try and sort out any technical issues. Perfect. Are there any kind of immediate kind of housekeeping questions before we get started? Feel free to kind of unmute yourself or put it in the chat. No? Okay. Perfect, right. I'm gonna hand over to Ugo, um, who's gonna run a quick opening round with us. Hey everyone, uh, lovely to, to meet you all and to also see a couple of familiar faces. And I thought, we thought that it would be great to get started uh, by just introducing everyone. And uh, because we're a large group, we're gonna keep it uh, quite uh, short. And um, what we are asking everyone is to just share your name and what repair group you are representing and a key thing that you are hoping to learn or share about repair data uh, during this session today. And uh, because we are a large group, I think uh, the, the main challenge is how to just go from one person to the next. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I suggest uh, uh, that we um, start, uh, I'll go in, uh, in the order that I have here. And so I'll just call people. <laughs> uh, so I'll start with uh, uh, Julie. Oh, hello. Uh, Julie King, I'm in Castlemaine, Victoria. I'm a relatively new uh, member of the Repair Cafe here, um, about one year, and my role is actually keeping records. So it's a very simple process that we have. It's a, actually a word uh, table. Um, we have people weigh the item, and we have a lot of debate about that, whether that's an appropriate way to do things, because we're trying to indicate to people what we keep from landfill, but weight isn't ideal, but it is easy. And we have people get involved in weighing their items and understanding and talking about their items. So they really do appreciate what our repairers do in preventing it from going to landfill. That's Great. me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Joe. Um, there's no other Joes, me, Joe. Uh, there's a Joe Murray. Sorry, I should have said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm another Joe. Do you want me to go? <laughs> so I'm Joe Murray. So I'm from the Repair Cafe Surf Coast. So we're in Victoria, Australia, um, on the Surf Coast on the Great Ocean Road. We've been going for about five and a half years. And uh, we do similarly to um, Castle, Maine, with weighing things. We currently keep all our information on a spreadsheet well, spreadsheet for each year. So after five and a half years, that's quite a lot of data, but it doesn't enable us to really analyze it or, or do much or, you know, in a time effective manner. So keen to learn what other methods are out there. Brilliant. Uh, Sue Leversley. Sorry for my pronunciation. I might not be the best. That's all right. I'm with Joe Murray, who just spoke. I'm with the Repair Surf Coast Repair Cafe, and yes, we, um, I'm I'm sort of responsible for the data and want to improve how we can, um, you know, give it out to other people, show what we do, etc. Use it in a way to maybe get grants and that sort of stuff. Great, uh, Catalina. Hello, I'm Catalina. Um, I'm with Darabin Repair Cafe. Um, we also weigh things and we have a spreadsheet which um, we enter the weight and whether it was fixed into um, and we've semi-automated within the spreadsheet so that it counts some of that stuff for us, but that's as far as we've got. Brilliant. Uh, Matthew Thien. 
Hi, I'm Matthew. Um, I work with Choice and we're doing some um, research into repair and how to uh, encourage people about how to repair things um, and how to encourage longer life or product lifespan increase. increase. Um, so I'm here to learn more from you about um, how we display that data, and how we collect it. Brilliant. Padma Lau. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm from Repair Cafe in Canada. Uh, we have been doing this for less than a year. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are pretty much doing anything and everything that we can make uh, our Repair Cafe operate efficiently. So you will see that I've got Erin Tiprinket uh, from Repair Cafe, and the two of us uh, look after all our data. <laughs> Uh, we have been fortunate in using the, uh, the repair monitor database as a way of actually uh, recording what we do. We've had a few issues, and I'm sure we can talk about some of those challenges, but we have used the information about the weight, the kinds of products, etc., what we have been able to repair for our community forum, Eco Forum, which was organized by our local state member. So we are, in fact, looking forward to learning about how other people record the data and particularly what data is most critical that we should have and what we can do with them. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, I see next the Redcliffe Peninsula Repair Cafe without a name. Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. My name is Les. Um, we started the Redcliffe Peninsula Repair Cafe two years ago. Uh, we've, uh, we've repaired about 62, 63% of the 372 items that have come through. So we've got some stats, but I'm really interested to see what the higher level, Leanne and others need to actually push this forward with governments of all levels to, um, to get some major changes done. So bearing in mind, we're all volunteers, so we all have, uh, sort of finite time so it would be good to perhaps uh, i think it's great that we're doing this i think it's perhaps um we need to start at a certain date if we're going to look at a certain time frame that we can start getting this data together it's an awesome so thank you everybody for getting this together brilliant thank you uh susan lloyd yeah hi i'm uh I'm Susan Lloyd. I'm with the Campbelltown Repair Cafe in Adelaide, South Australia. We've been running for two years. Uh, we collect the weight of our items, also how many items we have. And we've just done a tally for the number of volunteer hours for 2022. And we've worked out we've put in 1,318 hours of volunteer time. So that's not just coalface, but it's collecting our background information and stuff. Uh, we're very fortunate our local council gives us free use of the venue with storage. Um, at no cost. Um, so we've had great support and we use spreadsheets to, to store our data. We store it on a monthly basis and then I do a cumulative total for each year uh, so that we've got information. And we've started putting some stuff into a pictorial form as a graph because um, our repeat um, our customers have started asking us information about how much we've kept and what our numbers are and stuff. So we've, we've kept that sort of stuff. We probably fix around about three quarters of what we come have come in and we're lucky enough to have three um, qualified electricians amongst our volunteers. Great, um, excellent. So much amazing work you're doing all. Uh, Jim Straker. Thanks very much. I'm with uh, Malani Neighbourhood Centre. We have Fixit Cafe. Uh, Thursday will be our 10th anniversary since the, the cafe started. Uh, we've got uh, three, four good people who do the repairs. We basically have a sheet for every item. We do no collation of any data. Um, so I've yet to be shown why that's uh, important for us. Uh, we use a Facebook to get our stuff out. And one of the neighbor's friends uh, knitted up a little Mr. Fix-It. So we take pictures of Mr. Fix-It with the various items that we've done and that goes on our Facebook. Great, Erin.
Hi, um, yep, Erin here from Repair Cafe The Gap. I'm with um, Padma. Um, so pretty much what she said, we have a, a separate form for each item as well. Uh, it's the repair monitor form that we downloaded when we registered with Repair Cafe International. And then we upload the, you know, enter that data each month into the uh, repair monitor database. And we use that to get little graphs and stats and things like that out of for you know, different presentations and whatever that we do. Um, we also try to record the weight for the same reason that others have said. And uh, yeah, we were interested in finding out you know, how all this data collated can, can be useful and uh, help to lobby governments and companies and so forth to do better. Thank you. <clears throat> Vilma? Uh, hello, I'm uh, from Perth. Uh, we started uh, Repair Lab back in 2017, and in the meantime, uh, several uh, local councils have picked up and do their own now with our uh, how we organize it. Um, I organized the, the Repair Labs in the uh, Claremont uh, Muslim Park area, and I we have a per table, like we have the sewing table, the general repairs, the uh, jewelry repairs. Uh, bicycle, they all have separate uh, forms. Um, and at the end of the uh, of the event, we uh, or we I or I put it all together and see how many articles are repaired, and we communicate everything via Facebook. We make a lot of photos, uh, and I keep all the uh, paperwork. Uh, actually, uh, I have a whole stack now, and I have no idea what to do with it. So it's it's a try to be paperless, but it's still on paper because we, yeah, we have to do it manual. Um, but yeah, keen to know if there's better ways to, to do it. Great. Uh, John <laughs> Tenak, you're muted. Uh, yes, I'm John Tenak from Repair Cafe The Grove. We're in Fernie Grove and surrounding suburbs in the northwest corner of Brisbane. Um, we've been going since June, so we haven't had very long to collect uh, data, but we have been just capturing everything on uh, on paper for the first few sessions and really more interested in working out how our workflow and who was going to do what and all that kind of thing. So for the last um, couple of workshops, we, well, I have tried to do a bit of analysing um, what we've captured, um, really discovered that uh, the quality of the data capture was pretty poor. There were a lot of empty fields and things like that. So I thought that's not going to be very helpful when we come to feeding it into a, a larger database. So at this next session on Saturday, uh, we've designated one of our helpers to be the, um, the data quality person. And she's going to use the um, capturing people for a fixed photo uh, when they've got their repair done to also just run through and make sure everybody who's should have filled in a box has actually filled it in, uh, then, then we can probably get in the habit of doing that more accurately and that'll give us more reliable data to, to enter in. Just what database um, and how we do that, I look forward to discovering in this uh, session. Great. Uh, Kate Long. Yeah, I'm with the Repair Cafe Surf Coast in Victoria as well. And um, we've been going for five years. So we're really, or five and a half, really looking at how we can best use the data we do collect and what other data we should be collecting to make a very comprehensive picture of the entire operation. And also it helps with funding and publicity and so on. Great. Um, Kanchana? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kanchana. I'm from Griffith University. I'm an academic. Uh, I'm here to learn about how you collect data. Thanks. Brilliant. Uh, Soraya? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Soraya. I'm with Matt Steen from Choice. Um, I work as a user experience and interface designer. And I'm here to learn about repair data and have a think about um, visually representing that back to Australian consumers. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Evelyn? 
Blitman. Hi, um, I'm with uh, the St Hilda Repair Cafe in Melbourne. We started running in November 2017, um, and we're lucky enough that my husband uh, knows a bit about databases, and he built us a database to our to to, to, to match our needs. We record um, names and uh, postcodes of people who come to the repair cafe just to see sort of how wide ranging from Melbourne and different Melbourne suburbs they come. Um, also, whether the items are fixed, somewhat fixed or not fixed. Um, and it calculates percentages. We also record weight. Um, and yeah, so I can tell you that since uh, I, we also have um, a website on, on which we publicize that we've got 668 items fixed, which is 51% of those brought in, 191 almost fixed. Um, we've um, estimated to have saved 1,824 kilograms of, from landfill. But um, I do point out there that it doesn't tell the full story because it includes a lot of clothes as well and, and they don't weigh very much. Uh, oh, we, we're also lucky enough to have, um, we, it was started up by the Jewish Ecological Coalition together with the Port Phillip Echo Centre and the Port Phillip Echo Centre, we, we use their, um, their building, there's no charge to us. And so our funding basically comes from donations from, uh, from people who are, who've had something repaired and uh, they're very generous and it's it's enough to cover our expenses and even to allow us to to purchase some equipment. Great. Uh, Joe Pasco. Oh, that's me this time. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi, yeah, I'm Joe Cassar and I'm um, from the Pasco Vale Repair Cafe in Melbourne, operating operating out of the a uh, neighbourhood house, the Sussex neighbourhood house. Um, we're new to this, um, a bit like John a little earlier. We just started in June um, of this year. Um, at the moment, the um, data that we're collecting is fairly basic. So, you know, the number of items, um, the number fixed, the number not fixed. Um, the number of community members coming in, the number of repairers that we have. Um, the, I, I suppose I'm here to listen and to learn. Um, we've had um, fantastic interest from the community. Um, and I suppose our interest is, you know, what, what should we be collecting? How might we best collect it? Um, how might that help with our advocacy and our awareness raising? And I suppose the high level goal is how can we make this sustainable? Um, and I think, um, you know, hearing from Evelyn really, um, the sorts of questions that we're asking yourself is who might we partner with in, lo in the local community to, you know, ensure that it, it's sustained. Um, so we've got, um, you know, a local men's shed and we've got local sort of um, basket, you know, repair sewing type groups. So we're trying to sort of connect it all up, but it's very new and I'm here to learn. Thank you. Great. KB. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kirsten and I'm part of the Gin and Dairy Repair Cafe in Canberra. Um, it's a pretty small repair cafe and at the moment I'm just writing down items repaired literally on paper. What I'd be interested in is finding out not all the bells and whistles but, whistles, but just streamlined what is very valuable data to collect because I just wanted to keep it as short and easy as possible. Um, and also rather than double entry, if people have managed to use iPads or something like that where customers customers, people who come in can um, just enter the information directly into a database that is usable on an iPad. Brilliant. Uh, Mary? Hi, I'm Mary. Uh, we at the Merino Repair Cafe have been going on about a year and very interested to hear about the idea, like others have already said, about collecting data that's useful um, not just for us but maybe for sort of feeding into um, sort of promoting the idea of um, 
repairing using it as a tool in terms of government and I love the fact that choice is there today here today and thanks for putting it on and unfortunately I have to leave in about 10 minutes so I'll have to watch the recording after this but um, thanks for putting it on and look forward to hearing all the good ideas that we can use to keep our um, data sort of succinct and valuable thanks great yeah Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Neil Hahn and I'm from Repair Cafe in Double View, which is a western suburb of Perth, Western Australia. Um, the cafe has been running for four years. I've been with it for 18 months. I don't actually know what data we, we collect, but I'm interested in, in, in getting started with collecting and making the information useful. Great. Karen, hello. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, hello, Ugo. Hello, everybody. Thanks for putting this on uh, to the Restart Project and uh, the Australian Repair Network and Leanne Wiseman. Um, Mended Australia is a legacy project in retirement. It's pretty much self-funded uh, and has been for quite a long time. And uh, we do get the occasional donation, which helps with uh, uh, some uh, overheads like uh, fuel expenses to travel to uh, quite a number of uh, repair cafes around uh, the place. Um, data is of great interest to me for a number of uh, reasons. Personally, I studied statistics at university, and so I'm very interested in data. Um, and I quite like uh, collecting it and looking at it and, uh, and analysing it. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that I find interesting is uh, collecting uh, qualitative data. Uh, as Mended Australia, we like to collect the stories uh, of the repairs that Danny pretty much makes. I do make some uh, textile repairs. Um, and uh, so the stories to us are, are very important and that gives us great joy, whether it's a uh, written uh, story or um, in video or Instagram reels. Um, and we do that even at home. Um, so it's not just at repair cafes. Um, to support the Australian Repair Network um, in its uh, quest to uh, to front to government with some data uh, would be very uh, useful and I'm on the steering committee. So that's where my interest lies there to, to support um, uh, Leanne and the Australian Repair Network. And uh, Mended also collects some data um, related to its uh, kilometers traveled. Uh, so that's more its volunteering work, the kilometers traveled um, and I think that's uh, that's really all we're doing, um, other than the, the qualitative stuff. We have collected some at repair cafes for repair cafes, um, but that all just fell in a hole. It was all too hard, and the ones that were trying to do it just stopped doing it. And that was on repair monitor. Um, so I guess that we don't particularly want to collect the. Uh, uh, quantitative data ourselves as mended, but we certainly want to support repair cafes that we go to that are actually keen to um, uh, get that data. We, we'd like to support it. However, we do know the barriers to that and they'll no doubt come up later on. Brilliant. Uh, Pablo, you already wrote something in the chat, but maybe you want to share it. I'll just add, yeah, so the person who set up the cafe is on leave, so I've just stepped in, but um, uh, yeah, we're, we're, it's now become something bigger. We've only started in April, and now we're exploring a, a recycle uh, shop at a landfill site, which but we're looking at having repair cafes and giving spaces to other repairers and micro enterprises to do it. So it, it, if, if it gets up, it will be on scale. We might have dozens of people operating little micro enterprises out of that space. Um, but yeah, and our purpose, I guess, uh, f um, is, is really around creating employment pathways for people, in particular refugees, asylum seekers uh, and migrants. 
and we're really lucky we've we've got some super qualified electrical engineers etc who who um are doing the repairs for us because they can't find jobs as electrical engineers thank you so much uh georgia Hello, um, my name is Georgia. I am a lecturer at RMIT University in the School of Fashion and Textiles. And I'm just uh, with some colleagues commencing a research project around collecting repair data on clothing uh, through the method of running community repair events uh, on campus at RMIT University initially that can um, spread out into the community as well. Um, and for the purposes of informing product longevity within um, fashion and other opportunities for repair within the fashion and textile sector. Thanks. Great. Anna? Hello. Is it me? Am I the only Anna? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am um, a student at Griffith University and I'm working in Brisbane and I'm working under Leanne as part of a group of students um, doing a research project into um, starting repair cafes on um, university campuses. So this is really just a, a beginning, I suppose, to that research journey for me. Brilliant. Rosemary. Hi, I'm Rosemary. Um, I run the Paynham Repair Cafe, which is one of about 10 in Adelaide. I'm not sure how long it's been going. I think maybe about three years, but I've been running it for the past maybe 18 months. Although I've been involved in the Repair Cafe movement in Adelaide since it started. Can't remember when that was, maybe 2018, before COVID anyway. Um, we are a very small unit, so um, we do everything with paper and pen at the moment. Um, the details we collect are um, what the item is, how much it weighs, and whether it's been fixed or not. Um, we've started just on Saturday trying to collect when it's not fixed as to why it wasn't fixed. And also if the result has been to just give somebody advice rather than fix the item, whether the advice is, is um, you know, don't do that again, or, or you know, it, it, we can't fix it, nobody can fix it, or you'll have to take it to someone. Um, I'm really interested in the data collection personally, because I think it's really interesting just having a I was just looking at the right to repair material and it's really interesting, I think, to, you know, if this is all about finding out um, uh, what generally is repaired and, and what needs to be done to get the powers that be to change their policies and the legislation and the rules, because that's basically where we're going to make a big difference. But on the ground, I think the Repair Cafe movement is a fantastic movement in that it brings people together. So um, that's that's something that we do generate and try and generate at our Repair Cafe. I'm really interested to hear what everyone else has to say about you know how we can move forward. Excellent. Uh, Danielle? Don't know if Danielle can hear us. Otherwise, maybe Kate Nunga? Oh, I'm Kate, sorry. Hello, I'm Kate McGee. I am uh, on Noongarbuja, which is by the ocean and the Swan River in Perth, Western Australia. Um, and I am, I co-admin our local Buy Nothing with Wilma from Repair Lab in Perth. And uh, so when Wilma's been running the Repair Labs in Perth, I've volunteered to help at some of them. And um, Wilma's done so much work in Perth with local communities and local councils and groups that uh, I'm very lucky to have been mentored 
by her and she has helped me um provided me with the documentation and her learning and her experience so that I've been able to now start repair labs at UWA, uh, University of Western Australia. And we have now run four repair labs at UWA with the uh, students as the volunteer repairers, mentored by some of Wilma's external repairers who have taught them how how the repair labs work and how the documentation um is sort of filled out um and yeah so we're just sort of learning new ways of doing that mm -hmm. from from doing this um we've now had some school groups come forward and ask you know if we can help them look at how they can start doing repair labs uh within their school communities which is really exciting so yeah, and I, I I can I really resonate with a lot of the stories people have told, but in particular the qualitative sort of data and the I we ran a fashion repair lab during Sustainable Fashion Week uh, recently, and I was amazed at how many university students walk around with holes in their crutches. It was uh, <laughs> quite amazing. Um, so there is a uh, there is a need <laughs> at the universities uh, for sure, and it's it is very interesting to see how we're going to record that and what we can do with that information going forward. You're muted. Um. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Ugo, are you, are you with us still? Oh, sorry. I <laughs> was muting. Sorry. Brooke <laughs> Westerman. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, good. Hi, I'm Brooke. Um, I'm from Repair, Repair Cafe Wollongabba in um, Brisbane. We've been going for um, just at the nearly two years now, two mark, two year mark. Um, we started doing um, our data collection through Repair Cafe Monitor, so transferring it from paper forms onto there. Um, but we found that quite time consuming and that we were struggling to get a, the sort of amount of information we needed. Um, we now have an online booking system, which we find helps with collecting some of that data because um, the customers put that in themselves before they before they come so that that can be quite helpful in collecting more accurate sort of data about the item but yeah interested to learn about um how where we can put that data in sort of a more collective space because we have our data sort of sitting there we scan the forms in but it's um what we do with it sort of next I guess That's what I'm keen to learn about great and finally Louise who I believe joined us halfway through If you're able to unmute yourself, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm I'm Louise. I am a founder along with um, Sonia Kerslake of the Brisbane Bayside Repair Cafe. And we are we've got three coordinators too. So there's two of us and Chris uh, Lintot, who is amazing. We are very, very keen to put information in <clears throat> because I think that's something we all need to know about um, repairing. I'm also a coordinator for Women Manly Boomerang Bags and I tell you that because the team from Women Manly Boomerang Bags volunteers at the Repair Cafe and we use our sewing machines to do repairs and we get very busy doing repairs recently and yes we repair the crutches of pants quite quite regularly and yes so yep we've been we've only been going for a year this is at the the last one we had was uh, last weekend that's our last one for the year and we restart in february great great well brilliant thank you so much oh i think uh, evelyn raised her hand yeah uh, so i just wanted to add something on a, on a different tack of collecting data um, one of our repairers some time ago um, set up what he calls the Repair Cafe Body of Knowledge, which is something which he shares with the other repairers. So, for example, um, you know, like toasters, when they come in, what, what sort of things can and can't be fixed? And he's got a, 
uh, about a 20 page um, PDF, which in, um, which in which he shares all this sort of knowledge. So that's, that's just another aspect of data that, that can be useful to collect. Brilliant, thank you for bringing that aspect as well. Excellent, so um, it, it was a long intro, but I think it was excellent to hear the range of reasons and the range of concerns that people have. It will certainly help inform the rest of, uh, of the session for, for us and for everyone. Um, I have, uh, we have prepared a short presentation about how we work and uh, we'll share that. And during the presentation, feel free to ask questions in the chat and James will do his best to answer. And then otherwise we'll use them in the second part when we go in and break out rooms and uh, we can try to cover as much additional ground as possible. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Can everyone see me? I mean, the presentation, yeah, great, cool. Okay, uh, so we uh, at the Restart Project have been running pop-up repair events for 10 years. It was our 10th anniversary in uh, June. And, you know, like everyone else, pretty much, we started because we were frustrated with how many things could be used for longer if only there was a repair option. And we knew that there was plenty of skills still in our local community, but uh, it was not so easy to access it. And for many, many products, the range of paid repair options is very small compared to the amount of need that's out there. And there's a few key reasons that uh, we started from the very beginning collecting data, like many of you are doing now. Um, one was to measure our impact and to motivate volunteers and so that it could also help with some funding applications. But also, you know, recognizing that impact uh, means different things to different people and uh, it has an impact itself on what kind of uh, uh, data you end up concentrating on. And there's clearly multiple different approaches to this and we're not uh, uh, advocating just for there being one uh, size fits all. Uh, for us, the environmental aspect uh, has been from the beginning the driving force, uh, being able to demonstrate the amount of waste prevented, the amount of CO2 emissions prevented, which back when we started was something that not very many people have thought about yet. And then obviously with the kind of data that we collect came more of an awareness uh, that some of the information we collect can be used to advocate for more repairability and more broadly for right to repair uh, movement and legislation that's popping up uh, across the world. And now that's become a really key aspect of the work. And uh, I guess differently from other groups, what we uh, Restart did was we at one point uh, shortly after starting running the events, we kind of took a step back and look at how this problem can affect multiple uh, groups in and not just the, the repair events, the restart parties that we were running. And that's where we started creating uh, our own uh, tool that was called the Fixometer. And then it's evolved in what is now a platform called restarters.net uh, to help people collect data um, across groups. And then we started working with other organizations. As some of you mentioned, the Repair Cafe Foundation, we work with them uh, and we created uh, a standard uh, so that everyone uh, that adheres to these standards basically collects the same uh, type of information as core, helping us to aggregate the data. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. But so basically, just to say that we continue as an organization to support our local um, set of groups across London, but we've kind of started uh, early on and trying to network with other groups and organizations doing similar work because 
and your example uh, really <laughs> highlights this, even 10 years after uh, we started, uh, there's still plenty of questions around how best to go about the data collection, whether, what do we do with the spreadsheets? I mean, these are very recurrent questions, so it's totally worth uh, trying to demystify and, and have like a pragmatic approach going forward. <laughs> So obviously we run, like everyone else, uh, repair events uh, where the focus is indeed on repairing things. And uh, that is important uh, pointing out that because of that, often people are not in a position uh, because we're all, all people are volunteers. I mean, James and I have the luxury of doing this as our job now, but uh, you know, people that run repair events are all volunteers. And so you can't also expect data collection to be the most important aspect for everyone. Although some people are trying to implement a data volunteer uh, as a way to improve the amount of data that gets collected straight away. And what is this kind of data that we are collecting? It's not that different from what others have shared here. Uh, what we have done is try to uh, make it more aggregable by coming up with a range of product categories that uh, most of the things that we see at repair events uh, get fit, fit under. And we have identified some key aspects of all the products that are of interest to us. And these are obviously whether uh, the product was fixed or whether a uh, repair was started but not completed, but there's still hope for it to be completed at a later stage in a number of ways and whether the product is indeed end of life and so might only be useful to extract some spare part or maybe just needs to simply be recycled and we are interested in the brand of the product so that uh, someone in the future might analyze this data by brand uh, we also allow for the collection of data about the actual model number of the product, although we know that that is often complicated and uh, because of the massive range of products out there and colleagues at Choice will probably <laughs> nod in here, um, there's so many model numbers of so many variants that it's it, you would need a lot of data in order to be able to um, make some informed uh, comment about the repairability specifically about a specific model, a specific fault type, which is why we need open data to, to begin with and so that other people can benefit from it or build on it in the future. Um, other key aspects of the data for us is our, uh, the how old a product is. So, um, and I'll, I'll explain why a little bit later. And obviously what the problem uh, was with the product and uh, whether spare parts were needed for that repair. And in case the product was not repaired, um, what, what were the key barriers uh, to, that prevented us from repairing that product? And we also try to gather some information about whether the spare parts were provided by the manufacturer or not, uh, or were third party, and whether um, our uh, whether an additional bit of work uh, on the device uh, would need to be done by a professional repairer or by returning to a new repair cafe or restart event or uh, whether it could be the repair could be completed at home by the participant. And uh, our key focus is on uh, electrical and electronic products. Uh, now, this might seem controversial, but the real reason for this is, well, first of all, Restart as an organization started with 
environmental concerns around the growing mountain of e-waste 10 years ago. I mean, this is the origin of it all for us. But um, then starting to look at the data out there from uh, our events, from a range of repair cafes and from everyone else, uh, you'll see that on average, and of course, some groups will differ, but on average, approximately between 60 and 70% of all repairs um, that are done at repair cafes appear to be about small and larger electricals. And so it, it is indeed the majority, uh, which is not to say that repairs uh, on clothes or on bicycles, on furniture, on jewelry isn't important. Of course, it's important. But it went also when we look at the opportunities to uh, regulate uh, future products, we see for now uh, the bigger opportunities around uh, ensuring that future devices, future electrical and electronic devices will be made in more repairable ways. And, and that informs why um, we came together with organizations such as I fix it, the Repair Cafe Foundation, Anstiftung, which is the network of, the, it's a foundation that supports the network of uh, German repair cafes. That's the country where it's the highest number of repair cafes across the world to date. Um, and with the Fixit Clinics in the US to come up with the open repair data standard. So this standard uh, that I mentioned earlier, which literally helps comparing uh, the data from a repair cafe in Germany, from a group registered with the repair monitor that some of you have mentioned, with the data that's collected by Restart, with, with it, our own platform, restarters.net, with the data uh, that others, such as Repair Cafe Wales, which created their own platform, et cetera, et cetera. This standard is what allows us to pull the data together and uh, clean the data at times because there might be some problem with it and and allow us to make some statements about the data which you'll see in a moment and we pull together and uh, release this data twice a year at the moment um every six months and we're currently working on an aggregation of all data we have access to up to october 2022 which is to be released by the end of the year and uh, so you, you'll see this is the most recent aggregation. And the point is that everyone, uh, because the data is released as open source, uh, open data, uh, following the Creative Commons uh, CC uh, by uh, for um, SA, uh, share alike, sorry, by attribution and share alike 4.0, which is uh, for our use is the most uh, advanced uh, standard um, for license. Uh, everyone can reuse this data and build on it, provided that they keep sharing whatever they come up with, with the same approach. And so we want to inspire openness and uh, instill more of a sharing culture around the world. And um, this is a very important aspect of because we know that the data we collect is not providing all the answers, but it can help change a system which is currently based on secrecy, on lack of sharing, of manufacturers defending in all fora their choices of trying to provide as few spare parts as possible for their products and not providing the repair information and uh, trying to limit the way that people are trying to extend the lifespan of their products. So this is why ultimately all of this is important. And obviously bringing the data together allows us to analyze uh, what's happening in a number of ways. First of all, uh, you see like a massive spread of product categories with some of them being more uh, frequently brought to repair events. But what this tells us is that there is a wide range of products and it's important when you advocate for repairability in legislation, because very often we see as part of our advocacy on right to repair that the focus 
is just on a few product categories, almost as if people didn't care about getting everything else repaired. And so it's important to change the framing and remind the legislators that the same people that want their laptop to be repairable, they also want their coffee maker to be repairable, the toaster and everything else to be repairable. So that's important. Then of course, there's data around the, um, the percentage of products that get repaired and this kind of resonates with most of what uh, we've heard uh, this morning. Um, depending on the focus of groups, there is 50-55% uh, to 65-70% of success rate. Then obviously there is, um, depending on the mix of products that you see, if you see more electricals, you'll see probably a lower percentage. If you see more clothing, it's unlikely that you will fail uh, if you have the skills, which I personally don't, but I massively admire those that do. But basically, uh, this data is all about uh, electrical. So you'll see like a, the, the percentage of success is uh, more around the 50 to 55%. But what's most important is the other uh, pieces of information that we can gather, like from the kind of insights that we have. So, for example, uh, looking at what are the type of faults on smartphones in this case that uh, are seen and dealt with at repair events. Why is this important? Because in legislation that um, actually just uh, got discussed and finally voted on, although a public statement is still about to come at European level, um, we had to deal with manufacturers saying that, for example, making a, a charging port replacement available was not a priority. And in a meeting uh, with manufacturers and policymakers, we were able to say, well, according to the data from community repair, which might not be the best data, but certainly is data about real efforts by real people. And it's the only data that's openly available to the world. Uh, almost 6% of all the repairs that were attempted were indeed about replacing a charging port. So clearly it's not insignificant when you look at 200 million, over 200 million smartphones being sold in Europe alone and over a billion to a billion, 400 million, something like that a year around the world. Other examples of advocacy that can be done is on, you know, like what are the real barriers that people are experiencing when um, trying to repair things and not being able to, and, you know, lack of spare parts, Everyone knows that this is the case, but it's great to be able to have data to back up all of this so that we're not just talking about anecdotal evidence, but we're able to say, according to the data we collect, this is what's happening. And then another aspect is uh, the product age, which might seem not very important, but actually when you look at um, some of the legislative uh, approaches are about how long should a product be supported for and how long um, should uh, the spare parts or increasingly software be made available so that a product can continue to be used and reused. And if you look at this uh, graph here, you see that the products that are shortest live at the moment are mobile phones. And, uh, and that means that certainly some of the barriers that people experience um, are you know, around the availability of parts and around uh, software making a product obsolete or perceived as being obsolete in some cases. Well, we should act on that. But there's also other data, and I don't think I've included that in today's presentation, but that shows, for example, that for laptops, if you have um, a the, the vast majority of devices that we see are certainly older than what uh, policymakers think or manufacturers think the cycle of use of a laptop should be. So uh, our data show that over 40% of all laptops that are brought to community repair events happen to be older than five and a half 
years. And so that means people want to keep using these products. Of course, one could argue that people that don't want to reuse their products don't come to these events, of course. But we are trying to share um, a range of voices that typically are not listened to. And this is helpful in making a counter arguments about extending um, life of products by making the parts available and making the software available for everyone. I'll be very quick on this part of the work that we do, and it's a bit more experimental, is that we um, try to involve volunteers in analyzing the data so that some of the data that gets collected about, for example, um, you know, what was the problem uh, can be uh, collectively in a citizen science approach uh, be analyzed so that we gain some of these insights, such as the ones around um, how, what kind of faults are more prominent in uh, smartphones or in vacuum cleaners. Uh, but this is almost uh, uh, just for people that are very, very dedicated to analyzing data. And some of you might be, and not everyone though. But ultimately the data is used uh, in Europe, in this case, uh, more prominently because that's where we are based and that's where we saw uh, for now the biggest opportunities, but Leanne will tell us more about what's happening in Australia. And it's really helpful to be able to tell some of the stories and um, be able to also increase awareness about the size of the problem. And I think I'll stop here. I already went over time and uh, I will then uh, stop sharing and pass it on to Leanne, uh, maybe for a sense check of what the um, situation with the uh, Australian right to repair uh, opportunities. Thanks very much, Ugo, and thank you everyone. It's been a wonderful um, kind of exposure of what everyone is doing and where everyone is based. It's great to meet you all. I've met um, some or most of you, but it's terrific to hear all of the work that you've been doing. Um, just to give you a little bit of an update, um, in terms of the work that um, we've been doing in the Australian Repair Network is trying to pick up on the Australian Productivity Commission's um, recommendations that they made in their right to repair inquiry. Um, their final report was released in December 21 and there was a whole lot of recommendations around um, the barriers to repair in Australia. And they made a whole lot of recommendations around amendments to our Australian consumer laws and the possibility of the introduction of a repairability label similar to France and um, what's being considered in Europe that would appear on your products like a water or water efficiency or electricity efficiency um, label about repairability. Um, also, um, amendments to our Australian consumer laws around manufacturer warranties and consumers understanding. Um, there's also a range of recommendations around e-waste and product stewardship, but also around amendments to competition and intellectual property laws. So these are all sitting with our federal government at the moment. Um, part of, for those of you um, who've attended some of our workshops previously, we've highlighted that in the final report of the Productivity Commission, um, a lot of submissions were made by people around the barriers to repair. Um, some observations that were made by our commissioners was that um, it would have been great to have better information or better data around some of the barriers that were being alleged about access to spare parts and repair information about product um, durability, um, you know, premature obsolescence. So this is really um, part of the reason that we're trying to engage with our new federal government and with state and local governments um, to say that we do have evidence, we haven't, you know, been able to gather it and perhaps collect it in the best way. And that's why I'm really pleased to have Matthew Steen and his colleague here from Choice, because Choice is one of the consumer groups here in Australia that um, have a, a really a strong voice with government, um, as with other peak consumer bodies, and we're working closely with those groups 
There is a proposal in Australia as well that there might be something um, looked at what is called like a super complaint or a, like a class action on behalf of a whole um, range of products and brands in particular. And that would enable organisations such as Choice um, to say, look, there's a, a problem in this particular market with these particular brands. And so this is why we think um, the information that we can gather and collect will actually um, be instrumental in having conversations and dialogues, not only with manufacturers and industries, but also with our governments at local and state and federal level. And that's the work that we're, we're doing um, and continue to do. And that's why we um, really value the work that you're doing at the at the coal face, so to speak. Over Thank to you, you James. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, James will guide us to the next phase. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much, Hugo. Thanks so much, Liam. Um, and thank you all for your questions during a good presentation. I hope that answered a few kind of questions for you. Um, the plan now is to split into a couple of breakout rooms just to kind of get some smaller groups going to allow conversation to flow a bit more easily. Um, so I'm going to put everyone into a couple of different rooms. Uh, and the idea is that when you get to your room, um, we can talk about kind of barriers that we all face at the moment to kind of collecting repair data. So how are we collecting data at the moment? Um, and kind of what are the things that are stopping us collecting more data? Is it that we don't know what to collect, for example? Is it that we don't have time? We don't know what tools to use? Um, and so we can talk about basically how we can try and record more data um, and how we can share it, more importantly, um, with the kind of wider repair community, both in an Australian context and potentially globally as well, if that's something that, that you're interested in, having heard Hugo speak. Um, so I'm going to put people into breakout rooms now. Uga will be in one, I will be in the other. So if you've got questions, we're happy to answer them in the breakout room. And um, let's hope this works. So see you in there. And we'll have 15 minutes for this conversation. And afterwards, we'll come back into the main room together. Uh, and we'll ideally have one person from each room to very briefly report back on some of the key barriers and potential solutions found uh, in each breakout room. Um, so maybe start having a think if if you're up for uh, kind of summarizing what your your group says, maybe volunteer at the beginning of the group. Okay, uh, I'm going to put you into the rooms now, hopefully. Welcome back. Um, Ugo, I don't know about your group, but we we massively ran out of time and we could keep going for quite quite a lot longer. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the level of enthusiasm and involvement is super exciting so uh, i think there's you know some concerns and i, I think we'll um uh kate here uh will share from our group and uh I'd, i don't know if uh she's happy to go first yeah no worries it great thank you for collecting all the inputs by the way it's okay. I feel like we were just sort of getting our teeth stuck into it. Um, there's so much to consider when you look at um, what data is being collected, what data we want to collect, what are the limitations for collecting that data, and what are some ways to work around that. And I think one of the things that, that came from it was having some sort of consistency does make it easier if we want to uh, collectively use that data to, to bring about change um, but then the practical realities of when volunteers are busy doing repairs how do we then ask them to take you know in-depth details about brand model age of product and those sorts of things um, when sometimes there's already a queue where people are waiting for repairs and and there's lots happening and um, I think Part of it was looking at um, what information, uh, just from the discussions we were having, I was thinking it's interesting to maybe have some sort of infographic about what data provides us with what sort of information and how could that then be used so that participants and volunteers can see the benefit in taking the time to 
record it. Um, and also um, looking at, I'm just going through my notes because we were literally talking right to the last second. Um, just looking at different ways that people registered. So having a reception or having a try booking form, um, it was suggested that more creative ways are used to actually get some information perhaps before the person is there wanting the repair to be done. So if there was a try booking system set up where people can provide a photo, brand details and so on before they actually come in. Um, and again, it was then looking at how do we um, not make it too onerous on the volunteers in terms of having to upload the information multiple times or into multiple databases. So, how, so sort of picking and choosing one system um, and using that with consistency. Um, uh, just going through my notes again, sorry. Um, the other one was um, looking at um, if people are collecting data, what the legal implications are of that, and also sort of putting different lenses on when we look at the data collection in terms of uh, insurance and legislations in different states. Um, yeah, so I think that was that was about it. If I forgot anything, please jump in, guys. I think that's that's brilliant. <laughs> Over to your group, James. Um, I arrived a little late to our group, and I think we, I'm not sure whether we agreed uh, on who would be reporting back. So I'm happy to do it unless someone else is feeling um, enthusiastic and wants to summarize the conversation that we had. I'm happy to do a bit of a dive in there. Okay. Um, that was a, a great summary um, already given. And I guess we follow many, many of the same questions, which is um, what is the reason we want to collect this data? What's the purpose? What are we trying to achieve from it? Different groups actually have different focal, uh, focal point, um, depending on where their support and sponsorship comes from in our own uh, location. It's actually a, um, a, a community sustainability group. So we are looking at um, emissions and things like that, or would like to. But for others, it is about just getting the products um, out, keeping them out, the fact of keeping them out of um, landfill. Um, there are the, the reasons for it can be um, there for a split between the community or policy, political kind of influences. What kind of issues and the focus of our products? Electrical seems to be large with some, but others not so. Um, and there was a bit of a uh, some comment about um, weight as a as a as a factor, because if we're doing fabric, that's not enough. Uh, fabric that is cotton as opposed to poly, um, polyester, um, there is a, a big impact um, as to what the product is. Um, the value of having a standard template, which means that whether we have technology or not, we can actually begin to collect the data. And yes, it may not get uploaded straight away, but it is at least the correct kind of data is being collected. Um, the other factor is that we also think it's important to have the discussion. So collecting the data is one thing, but the discussion with people, the, um, the reason the community and building that community, uh, I know from our own uh, experience, we have people come back again and again because they enjoy the experience of being there. They enjoy watching the repair process and learning something about it as they go. So that's an important part of the process too. And I think that's it, unless somebody else would like to add some. Good stuff, Judy, thanks. Brilliant. Yeah, I just wanted to add to it, and I know we're kind of coming to a conclusion, but, um, and thanks everyone for being up for staying on <laughs> longer than planned. But I think the the whole point of the data collection should never really detract from the social and all the other values of these activities. I think in a way it's just trying to add an extra pillar 
in the importance in the community because of course all the social and the skill sharing and uh, inclusion aspects of this work in a way comes first and all will always come first will always come first but there's an additional element which is being able to collect the data and the stories uh, and be telling compelling uh, points about why we need more repairable products and uh, to remove all the barriers that prevent us from fixing. And, and I think using the combination of the data and all of the other good reasons to uh, remove barriers to repairability, that is really going to help us uh, win over uh, a lot more skeptics. So absolutely, data doesn't mean that the stories of why uh, people want to repair aren't as important. It's just like another layer that can help us in some other context. And also, uh, I, I would like to just remind everyone that there isn't like one uh, size fits all here and that uh, different platforms uh, take different routes. Uh, but that's exactly why we recommend that uh, you do pick one platform that works best for you. And uh, um, and we're happy, we're not going anywhere. We're happy to provide further advice if you know, as at the national country level, you wanted to go ahead and, and try to have a, a, a united effort. And we're happy to advise further. And uh, um, yeah, so for any questions, we'll be there. And uh, uh, Leanne will share our contacts alongside the slides and a uh, few helpful links. And uh, thanks again, Leanne, for inviting us. And thanks all of you for all of your uh, efforts in your groups, first of all, and uh, for all the enthusiasm and the contributions you've shared today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um... Ugo and James thank, and the Restart Project, thank you again and thank you to everyone. Um, just to follow up on some of the questions I was typing in the chat, um, if you have been passed this link to this webinar by someone else, what that means is I don't have your email or um, we don't we aren't in contact with you individually. So um, it would be great. Um, the way we're trying to gather people together is if you can sign up to the Australian Repair Network, and if you just Google that and put Griffith University, um, the reason just for the sign up is that we're trying to collect a database of repair stakeholders so that we can communicate with you when we hold our events um, and for any updates. Um, so if you if you could do that, that would be fantastic because I would love to have all Repair Cafe members um, on an email list so that I can communicate with you um, as things develop and we can continue this conversation, um, you know, and plan future events for you again. So I really appreciate giving your time. And again, thank you to James and Ugo for giving their time this morning um, in the UK as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>